recess at any time. Before I deliver my opening remarks, I wanted to note that today the committee is meeting both in person and virtually. I want to uh, announce a couple of reminders uh, to the members about the conduct of this hearing. First, members and staff who are attending in person and are unvaccinated against COVID-19 must stay masked throughout the hearing. Uh, unvaccinated members may remove their masks only during their questioning under the five minute rule. Members who are attending virtually should keep their video feed on as long as they are present in the hearing. Members are responsible for their own microphones. Please also keep your microphones muted unless you are speaking. Finally, if members have documents they wish to submit for the record, please email them to the committee clerk whose email address was circulated prior to the hearing. So good morning, and thank you uh, all for joining today's hearing, and a special thank you to our witnesses for joining us here today. Two years ago, I had the honor and privilege of chairing the first hearing on recycling in this committee in almost over a decade. Since then, much has changed, but the problem of plastic waste and how to enable a circular economy for recycling continues. We only have to look to the past year and a half to see some of the important medical and safety functions of Plastic. Face shields, face masks, and other personal protective equipment allowed America's essential workers to be on our front lines of our nation's COVID-19 response. Disposable syringes are, are helping to deliver vaccine shots in arms all across this country. Plastic can be designated to be rigid enough to use in, in vehicle safety applications, dur durable enough to hold liquid products for years, and flexible enough to keep our food fresh. Virgin plastic is also cheap to produce. Unfortunately, the characteristics that make plastic convenient also make it difficult to recycle and to manage after it has been used. Global plastic production increased from 2 million tons per year in 1950, we remember plastic, 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 to 400 million tons annually in recent years. What's more, if current trends continue, plastic production is projected to quadruple by 2050. So there is no one size fits all solution here, but what we do know and where we want to start is with reducing, reusing and recycling. Historically, the US has done a great job, or excuse me, has not done the best job at recycling. We recycle less than 9% of our plastic waste despite all the campaigns that are pursued across the country. For more than 20 years, the U.S. shipped our plastic waste to international markets to be recycled. When one of the major markets closed in 2018, items collected for recycling sat in warehouses because many cities across the nation didn't have a local recycler that could process these bales of plastic, which were too often highly contaminated. Unfortunately, our communities face the choice of incinerating recyclables or dumping them in landfills. While market, economic, and other factors led to the current plastic pollution crisis, part of the solution can be to invest in research to reduce plastic waste and improve domestic recycling infrastructure cap and capabilities. This past Earth Day, I was proud to introduce the Plastic Waste Reduction and Recycling Research Act alongside my colleague from Ohio, Congressman Anthony Gonzalez. The bill calls on the federal government to develop a strategic plan for plastic waste reduction and directs the Office of Science and Technology Policy to establish a program to leverage the expertise of federal science agencies, academia, scientific associations, state and local governments, and the private sector. This bill will support research and international standards development to spur innovative, sustainable solutions that could create a world-leading U.S. industry in plastics recycling. 
Research is absolutely needed um, into how to design plastics to be recyclable, upcycle existing, existing plastic into high value products, minimize environmental impacts of plastic waste, and recycling on our climate, and to improve plastic waste management to prevent plastic from entering our air, soil, and oceans. Finally, this legislation would support the measurement science needed to make sorting technologies more efficient and to update standards for characterizing the multi-layered plastic packaging materials used today. No one solution will completely solve plastic pollution. Rather, it will take multiple efforts. The, the research supported in this bill can drive innovation, and innovation is at the heart of American industry and manufacturing that creates jobs. I look forward to hearing from our distinguished witnesses as our committee explores challenges and opportunities for adopting sustainable upstream plastic waste reduction solutions and improvements to the recycling system. Before I yield to Mr. Waltz for his opening statement, I would like to enter into the record two letters of support for the Plastic Waste Reduction and Recycling Research Act from the American Chemistry Chemical Society and the National League of Cities. The chair now recognizes Mr. Waltz for an opening statement. Thank you, Madam Chair. And before I give my opening statement, I'd like to wish you a happy birthday. <laughs> Uh, and, and I uh, share your passion for this topic. I'm an avid recycler, and my 17-year-old daughter uh, keeps, keeps me on track uh, in that regard. So good morning. Uh, thank you for holding uh, today's hearing. It's good to be in the hearing room with you. Uh, and I, I look forward to examining emerging technologies in plastics recycling. Uh, I'd also like to thank our witnesses uh, for appearing before the subcommittee and sharing their expertise uh, with us. You know, as we take a step back, it's, I, I want to note that in the 20th century, the United States was a leader in the development of plastics. It, we revolutionized the world by making material wealth widespread and obtainable like never before. However, uh, the U.S. recycling infrastructure has failed to keep up with the booming plastic market. In 2018, the U.S. produced 36 million tons of plastic, as the chairwoman noted, uh, uh, noted. However, the domestic recycling industry only repurposed eight and a half percent of it. Uh, America has a new opportunity to lead in the development of a circular economy of plastics, an economy that produces, recycles, and reuses materials to reduce cost and waste. Investments in research and development of new sustainable materials and recycling technologies will help the environment and the U.S. economy. Uh, for example, with advanced recycling tools and technologies, we can fully repurpose plastic without needing to harvest any new resources. In essence, we can turn waste into a marketable commodity. And the economic potential here truly is immense. Uh, according to a report by the American Chemistry Council, advanced plastics recycling could support over 38,000 U.S. jobs and produce nearly 10 billion in U.S. economic output. Today, plastics are integral to our daily lives, uh, but we cannot ignore their impact on the environment. In my district in Northeast Florida, we are blessed with miles of beautiful coastline. It's a main focal point of our lives and of our economy. Moving from plastic waste to plastic reuse ensures the protection of Florida's pristine beaches, which many uh, on this committee like to visit, uh, and the Florida and Floridians' economies uh, that rely on healthy coastal ecosystems. I recently had uh, the real pleasure to visit the Loggerhead Marine Life Center in Jupiter, Florida, uh, uh, which was amazing uh, to see the research uh, and the marine life that they are helping there, but it was also very disturbing uh, to see the amount of microplastics uh, that are appearing in our ocean food supply. It was staggering and it's dangerous uh, and we absolutely need to take action. Um, I believe that using innovative methods to bolster and optimize our domestic plastics recycling will not only preserve this environment, preserve our environment, but also avoid costly regulations. 
And that's unlike the plastic provisions in the Green New Deal. Uh, additionally, as demonstrated over the last year, our national security is at risk as long as we are dependent on foreign nations, particularly on the Chinese Communist Party, for essential commodities or services. America's clean energy future requires a reliable and stable supply of critical minerals. My bill, the Crit American Critical Mineral Independence Act, addresses the issue of America's reliance on foreign nations to obtain critical minerals. I'm pleased that a provision of the legislation was included in the NSF for the Future Act that recently passed this committee. When it comes to recycling, the U.S. cannot remain export reliant. For one, media reports regarding China's 2018 plastics importation restrictions highlighted that China never actually disposed of plastics properly. Secondly, we should not become reliant on China for yet another critical service, especially when there's untapped economic gain to be had here at home. The Science Committee's role is to look to innovation to solve major challenges facing our nation, and it's just what we're doing here today. We have witnesses from academia and industry who are working on new solutions on, to plastics recycling, including chemical recycling and applying robotics and artificial intelligence to material sorting. I look forward to having a productive, insightful conversation. Innovation in these areas will ensure a better world for our children and grandchildren. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I yield back. Thank you. And the chair now recognizes the chairman, chairwoman of the full committee, Chairwoman Johnson, for an opening statement. Good morning. And thank you, Chairwoman Stevens, for holding today's hearing. And happy birthday. Leaders across the globe are wrestling with the need to reduce plastic waste. And I appreciate the fact that you, Chairwoman Stevens and Congressman Gonzalez, this bipartisan leadership on legislation you introduced supporting research and development activities to help reduce plastic waste. Communities across the country, including my district in Dallas, Texas, are trying to find solutions to deal with the increasing levels of plastic waste. The statistics concerning plastic pollution are indeed staggering. In 2018, plastic waste was the third largest source of municipal solid waste in the United States. In that year alone, we generated 35.7 million tons of plastic waste. Recycle 3 million tons, combusted 5.6 million tons, and put 27 million tons of plastic in waste landfills. These statistics make it imperative to support research that can help us move forward in a sustainable way. Experts agree that no single solution will solve the plastic waste crisis. We must have an all the all of the above approach. To that end, it is important to understand barriers to the current recycling system, the potential for upstream solutions, and what research technology and data gaps we need to fill. Also critical is understanding the need for standards development and new assessment models to help us achieve sustainable systems. Collaboration will be key between federal agencies, state and local governments, academia, the private sector, and international partners. Today's hearing is very important. And, uh, and, and the step we're taking with it is achieving, working toward achieving sustainability uh, goals for our environment. And I look forward to this discussion and I thank you and yield back. Great. Thank you, Madam Chair. And if there are members who wish to submit additional opening statements, your statements will be added to the record at this point. Uh, also at this time, I'd like to introduce our witnesses. Our first witness is Ms. Keith Harrison. Ms. Harrison is 
the chief executive officer of the Recycling Partnership, a national nonprofit dedicated to protecting the planet by fixing recycling and activating a circular economy throughout the United States. She is an international speaker, media pundit, and environmental author dedicated to engaging companies in making measurable, lasting change in communities. Under her leadership, the Recycling Partnership has grown significantly, engaging more than 70 funding partners and reaching more than half of American households. Our next witness is Dr. Mark Hillmeyer. Dr. Hillmeyer is the Director and Principal Investigator of the U of University of Minnesota NSF Center for Sustainable Polymers. He joined the Department of Chemistry faculty at the University of Minnesota in 1997 and is currently the McKnight Presidential Endowed Chair in Chemistry at the university, where his research focuses on the synthesis and self-assembly of multifunctional polymers. Dr. Hillmeyer served as an associate editor for the ACS Journal uh, from 2018 to 2017, and he has been editor-in-chief since 2018. Our third witness is Dr. Gregory Keolian. Dr. Keolian is the Peter M. Wedge Professor of Sustainable Systems at the University of Michigan and serves as the director of the Center for Sustainable Systems. He also holds appointments as a professor in the School for Environment and Sustainability and the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering. His research focuses on the development and application of life cycle models and sustainability metrics to guide the design and improvement of products and technology. Our final witness is Mr. Joshua Baca. Mr. Baca is the Vice President of the Plastics Division at the American Chemistry Council. In this role, he oversees strategic programs to advance a science-based policy agenda, national outreach, and sustainability initiatives on behalf of America's leading plastic makers. He also leads industry initiatives and fosters multi-stakeholder dialogue around helping end plastic waste by creating a more circular economy. As our witnesses should know, you will each have five minutes for your spoken, spoken testimony. Your written testimony will be included in the record for the hearing. When you all have completed your spoken testimony, we will begin with questions. Each member will have five minutes to question the panel. We will start with Ms. Harrison's opening testimony. Madam Chairwoman and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to speak with you about this important topic. As you know, I am the CEO of the Recycling Partnership, and we are a national nonprofit that works with companies, communities, and policies to strengthen the U.S. recycling system. You may remember a recent campaign in D.C. to boost recycling. That was an example of the type of grants that we give and how we partner with thousands of cities across the county, across the country. The Recycling Partnership is designed to bring together public and private sectors because without coordination, recycling will never deliver the solutions that we all need. Recycling is when something old becomes something new, new again, but we need to ensure that that is by plan and not just by chance, as is the current case. And we're here today to talk about how to execute that plan, a shared vision for the future, one of a circular economy, Moving away from a linear economy where we take raw materials from the planet, make stuff out of it, just to bury, bury all that value back in the ground after a single use. Committee members, recycling is so much more than just putting things in a recycling bin. It's really about smarter feedstocks and stronger methods for manufacturing. But there's a hitch. As many of you have heard, recycling faces barriers that it needs help and overcoming. That's why we're here today. And in fact, the Recycling Partnership just wrote a report that you may be interested in. It's called Paying It Forward, How Investing in Recycling Will Pay Dividends. And it outlines how to fix the U.S. recycling system and deliver rewards to the environment and the economy. Now, when it comes to plastics, technology has an important role to play in delivering that better system. R&D can help us answer important questions like, how do we better design plastics products to meet the demands of the infrastructure? 
things like labels, inks, adhesives, they make a big difference in determining if something is truly recyclable. Similarly, how do we make sure that improvements of the infrastructure are aligned with all the innovation of what's coming into the system, what is being designed? How can we develop standards to make sure that businesses across the country know what quality of recyclable feedstock that they're getting? And exactly, how can we make sure that recycled content supply is available for U.S. businesses, like businesses in all of your states? There's Unify in North Carolina, turning old soda and water bottles into recycled fiber for clothes. Hollywood is in Indiana, making indoor or outdoor furniture out of detergent bottles. Envision Plastics in California, capturing ocean-bound plastics and producing feedstock for shampoo and soap bottles for companies like Method in Illinois. There's Shoepan in Michigan, Indorama in Texas, Alpac in Pennsylvania, all turning bottles into new bottles. So why does this matter to this committee? Three things should be top of mind for our discussion today. System solutions, scale, and speed. R&D that focuses on those three things matter most. Technology only helps if it's part of a system. What's not needed? One-off technologies, silver bullets, individual projects that don't add up to systems change. Each one of those businesses that I mentioned and all the others like them have to overcome technical barriers in order to become profitable and grow. We need research to turn those technical barriers into bridges, helping to create a circular economy, not just by chance, but by plan. We commend this committee for its attention to plastics in a circular economy, and I'm grateful for the opportunity to testify today. The Recycling Partnership looks forward to working with you on solutions that create jobs, protect our planet and its people. Thank you. Thank you. And now we will hear for Dr. Hillmeyer. Thank you. Uh, Chairwoman Stevens, Ranking Member Waltz, Chairwoman Johnson, and Ranking Member Lucas, and distinguished members of the subcommittee. Thank you for the invitation to provide testimony in uh, today's hearing. I'm quite honored to have this opportunity to speak with you today. I'm a professor of chemistry at the University of Minnesota and the director of the National Science Foundation uh, Center for Sustainable Polymers, which is a center for chemical innovation headquartered here at Minnesota. Uh, polymers are the molecules of plastic, and I have worked in the field of polymer science since my time as an undergraduate researcher at the University of Florida. I earned my PhD in chemistry studying polymers at the California Institute of Technology. Since beginning as a professor of chemistry at Minnesota, I've worked in the areas of sustainable polymers and much of my research today has connections to sustainability. As the director of the Center for Sustainable Polymers since its inception in 2009, I've led numerous research efforts and managed a broad research portfolio focused on sustainable polymers. I really have a passion for advancing sustainable polymers through basic research endeavors that enable a circular economy for future generations. As a society that depends on plastics every day and in nearly all established, new, and emerging high and low tech applications, uh, we're faced with a crisis. The comforts, conveniences, and efficiencies associated with the use of these modern materials also comes at a cost. Ever increasing, broadly distributed, and persistent plastic pollution. Moreover, nearly all the new plastic that is produced globally every year is derived from non-renewable fossil resources, thus contributing to the depletion of finite feedstocks harbored by Earth. While we all know about plastics recycling and the chasing arrow indicators on plastics, the fact is that a very small percentage of plastics are effectively recycled. Uh, to make matters worse, most plastics are used for a short period of time, for example, in packaging or disposable serviceware, and then immediately disposed of and often uh, indiscriminately. Uh, the value of plastic of that plastic material is lost, waste is generated, and uh, very little is ultimately recycled. A staggering level of these discarded materials and the microplastics derived therefrom end up on our landscapes and waterways causing environmental and ecological damage. The resulting negative impacts to the food chain and ultimately to our own health is of clear concern. Using oil and gas to make plastics that typically have very short use lifetimes end up in the environment and cause damage to our ecosystems is simply unsustainable. However, we all need plastic. Um, these remarkable materials are so important, it's difficult to imagine modern society without them. In fact, in fact, plastics contribute to sustainability in positive ways, such as in lightweight transportation, food preservation, and renewable energy applications. 
The other main contributing factor for our extensive use of plastic is that these materials are generally available at very low cost. The performance to price ratio of plastics is about as high as it gets. Uh, while I can argue that we all need plastic, we don't need all plastic. Uh, certainly unnecessary plastic materials permeate our society and dematerialization will unquestionably play an important role in a sustainable polymer future. There are some places where we simply use too much plastic. We need a major change in the way we produce, use, dispose of, and recycle plastics. The goal of zero plastic pollution is a lofty but necessary one for a sustainable plastics future. To realize this vision, there are many interwoven factors and needs. These include policy initiatives, improved recycling practices, other end-of-life infrastructure, and industry adoption of sustainable alternatives for current plastic products, packaging, and processes. I'm here today to emphasize the fact that basic and fundamental research in sustainable polymers is and will continue to be essential to build a strong foundation from which new, technology, new sustainable technologies can be built. Uh, this is where government, industry, and private foundation support all play critically important roles. Uh, basic research in sustainable polymers that aim, aims to uncover the underlying principles associated with, for example, efficient conversion of renewable feedstocks to valuable chemical intermediates, green processes to incorporate those chemicals into advanced polymeric structures, and how to design materials for viable and sustainable end-of-life scenarios post-use will all positively contribute to a sustainable polymer future. This important research aimed at understanding fundamentals and revealing what is possible with sustainable polymers is decades behind analogous work in non-renewable, fossil-derived, non-degradable, and practically non-recyclable materials that dominate today's landscape. Significant effort, support, and new initiatives are imperative for future generations to enjoy the benefits of plastics while simultaneously eliminating their negative consequences. In my written testimony, I provide an overview of research efforts carried out in the National Science Foundation Center for Sustainable Polymers, my view on broader research needs in the sustainable polymer arena, and my support for the proposed Plastic Waste Reduction and Recycling Research Act. Thank you again for this opportunity to testify today. I am truly honored to be here to uh, be able to share my thoughts and visions for a sustainable polymer future, and I look forward to answering any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hillmeyer. The, the honor is all ours. And with that, we will hear uh, from uh, Dr. Keolian. Thank you, Chairwoman Stevens and Ranking Member Waltz and all of the other members of this subcommittee. My name is Greg Keolian. I serve as director of the Center for Sustainable Systems at the University of Michigan and professor in the School for Environment and Sustainability in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering. My research focuses on the development of life cycle models and sustainability metrics to guide the design and improvement of products and technology. Our center recently developed the first comprehensive characterization of plastics use by resin type across the US economy. I wish to offer some observations and recommendations based on this and other plastic sustainability research with industry, ranging from milk packaging to building insulation. The plastics waste crisis is more than a packaging waste problem. Two thirds of the plastic put into use in the US went into markets other than packaging, including consumer products, furniture, electronics, transportation, and buildings, each with unique challenges and opportunities. Less than 8% of the plastics retired in these products are recycled. Multiple technical and economic barriers limit plastics material recovery. In theory, most of the thermoplastics used in packaging have a high recyclability, but actual low recycling rates can be traced to inexpensive virgin feedstocks combined with material quality issues. Plastic content in e-waste is estimated at 20 to 33%, and commercially viable mechanical recycling systems cannot handle the current volume and diversity of plastics and e-waste. Buildings are using increasing amounts of plastic for piping, siding, trim, plastic wood composites, as well as insulation. Recovery is extremely challenging given the, that building demolition produces mixed waste with low fractions of plastics. Plastics growth in transportation sector has been primarily due to lightweighting efforts and the specialized properties that engineered resins afford. Plastic recovery from auto shredder residue is challenging. 39 different plastic types are used to make cars. Separation technologies are very capital intensive and the cost to separate, clean, and collect often exceeds that of virgin plastic, especially with low oil and natural gas prices. Systems analysis tools are necessary to overcome these challenges. First, research is needed to fill in gaps in plastics material flow. 
Improved characterization will facilitate coordination between product design, manufacturing, and material recovery efforts. This is needed to direct R&D and capital resources towards bottleneck stages in greatest need of in, in innovation. Second, life cycle analysis models are needed to guide innovations and robust cost-effective solutions. Life cycle assessments of plastics used in products can elucidate trade-offs and guide improvements. They are necessary to avoid burden shifting and promotion of less environmentally sustainable alternatives. Third, emphasize interdisciplinary R&D to develop plastic waste solutions. At the core, the current plastics waste crisis is an economics problem. Sustainable solutions are effective when there is alignment between technology, markets, policy, and behavioral drivers. Interdisciplinary research bringing together engineers, industrial ecologists, economists, policy analysts, behavioral scientists can achieve convergence and robust solutions more quickly. Also, implementation, implementation can be accelerated when academics, industry, government, and community partners co-create solutions. Fourth, R&D should target product system design solutions beyond recycling. I strongly encourage the broadening of the research scope to develop solutions that can avoid or limit generation of waste. These strategies include dematerialization, material substitution, service life extension of products, reuse and remanufacturing. Fifth, develop a roadmap to guide R&D coordination across agencies. This can help set research priorities and avoid research duplication given the wide array of resin and composite types used for the wide range of plastic applications, each with varying lifetimes. Finally, plastic waste reduction solutions should also reduce carbon emissions. Humanity is facing a carbon emergency, a climate emergency. We need to prioritize technological plastic waste reduction innovations that can also create solutions to accelerate greenhouse gas emissions to zero. In conclusion, solutions to plastic waste crisis will require a major transformation of systems through technology, community engagement, behavior change, and policy innovations. Technological innovations in recycling alone will not be sufficient. I, su I fully support the goals of the committee's legislation and hope my systems analysis-based recommendations will help strengthen programming and implementation. Appreciate the opportunity to share my perspectives and welcome your questions. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Keolian. And now we will hear from Mr. Bakoff. Good morning. Let me first start off by thanking the subcommittee for holding this important hearing today. I want to commend the chairwoman from Michigan for her leadership on this issue, her pragmatic approach in driving actions, and her collaborative style in bringing stakeholders together to solve big challenges we face as a nation. The American Chemistry Council's Plastics Division is pleased to provide testimony to this subcommittee. Our members are the leading producers of modern plastic materials used to make countless consumer and durable goods used in a variety of applications and innovations that improve the quality of our lives, our environment, and our economy. ACC encourages passage of the Bipartisan Plastic Waste Reduction and Recycling Research Act. If passed, this legislation would direct federal government resources to improve the global competitiveness of U.S. plastics recycling and ensure U.S. leadership in plastic waste reduction and recycling research. It would also help capture the value of used plastics through enhanced research and development and create standards, tools, and technologies necessary to modernize and expand today's recycling systems. Finally, it will accelerate the research and development for advanced recycling technologies. Our members are deeply committed to creating a circular economy for plastics and ending plastic waste in the environment. Plastics contribute to sustainability goals, which help protect the American environment for future generations. Plastic waste does not. Waste in the environment, including plastic waste, is never acceptable. We are eager and taking action to solve this problem. That's why in 2018, America's plastic makers established two ambitious circular economy goals. By 2030, 100% of US plastic packaging will be recyclable or recoverable. And by 2040, 100% of US plastic packaging will be reused, recycled, or recovered. Last year, we released our Roadmap to Reuse, which outlined a vision and a set of actions to mobilize the entire plastics value chain to achieve these goals. Our industry has worked to grow the circular economy for all plastics by implementing our roadmap. 
Since July of 2017, our industry has invested nearly $6 billion to grow plastics recycling in the United States, most of it in advanced recycling technologies. While traditional recycling processes will continue to play an important role in plastics recycling, they do face some important limitations. Newer, cutting edge technologies known as advanced recycling complement these traditional systems by picking up where they leave off and enabling communities to recycle significantly more types and greater quantities of plastics. Advanced recycling technologies are innovative manufacturing processes that fundamentally transform the chemical structure of post-use plastic back to their basic chemical building blocks. These building blocks are the raw materials used for making virgin quality plastic and other valuable products. They enable more types of plastics to become resources for new manufacturing, conserving natural resources, and helping grow local jobs and economies. Momentum for advanced recycling is accelerating across the United States, and the Plastic Waste Reduction and Recycling Research Act will help sustain that momentum. Globally recognized corporations and mature recycling enterprises are making significant commitments and building infrastructure at a commercial scale. Technology has evolved and created new opportunities and tremendous breakthroughs that can create virgin quality packaging critical for demanding applications such as food grade and pharmaceutical packaging. There is a significant and growing market for recycled products driven by company commitments and consumer demand for using more recycled plastic and products. 14 states have enacted legislation to update their existing laws, so companies are more appropriately regulated in their deployment of advanced recycling technologies. And a first wave of advanced recycling enterprises is achieving third-party validation through international certification. We believe with the right approaches and commitment, the challenge of plastic waste in the environment is solvable and collective actions by government, industry, nonprofits and NGOs will make America more sustainable. The stakes are high. Plastics are critical to a modern society from lightweighting vehicles to reduce carbon emissions, to sealing and insulating our homes and buildings, to delivering essential health care, preserving food and preventing food waste and contributing to an overall higher quality of life. Again, I wanna thank the subcommittee for holding this important hearing today. We appreciate the opportunity to collaborate on this legislation and future legislation. And I yield my, back, my time back to the chairwoman. Great, thank you so much, Mr. Baca. And as you can all tell, we've got a great group here and um, this is making for a, just a very exciting hearing. And so at this point, we're, we're gonna move to our first round of questions and the chair is gonna recognize her herself for five minutes of questioning. Um, a, a recent federal study found that contamination of recyclables is a major cross-cutting challenge to the U.S. recycling system. I, I've seen this in my own district in southeastern M Michigan when I talk to my municipal leaders or others in industry. Um, contamination of recyclables can occur when non-recyclables, such as plastic bags, are not sorted from recyclables or when food residue on recyclable plastic materials makes them non-recyclable. Ms. Harrison, what steps can we take to ensure businesses and consumers know the quality of plastic feedstock that they are acquiring for making new products? So I love this question because it's really about how do we make sure that recycled content is competing with virgin, right? If recycling is all about manufacturing and it has to compete on price, on quality, and on volume. Manufacturers need to know that they can depend on recycled feedstock to be there when they need it. So contamination, I think, can be put into two buckets. One, uh, missteps in the design of a product. I mentioned labels, adhesives. We need thought that goes into how packaging is designed. And I would encourage the committee to look at plasticiq.com. It's a new tool, a free tool that we just desi designed uh, with support in, uh, from Walmart to help suppliers align around common design uh, challenges so that we know as consumers, when we get something off the shelf, it is in prime recycling condition. And then the second thing, the second bucket of where contamination comes in is really in the household. 
That that challenge is when uh, we can sometimes call this wish cycling, when people hope that something is recyclable and so they put it into the bin. They're confused and not really knowing what it's about. Does it have the arrows on it? So that part point of what, how do we engage the public is a really important one um, because it's not just awareness. We know the public is aware of recycling. What we need to get to is how do we engage them in the correct behavior of what to recycle on which day? Education has been woefully underfunded in this country. Uh, consumers are concerned and confused. And I think that if we marry how things are designed for the system with how we uh, leverage that public will, we'll find a better outcome. We're doing work in communities right now. We have a program called Feed on the Street, where we partner with communities to, to make sure that we are addressing the key challenge to contamination for that city. Um, and that program uh, uses oops tags on carts to, to really trigger the problem that an individual household is making. You know, the number one challenge to recycling that many people make is they're trying their best, best and they put all those recyclables in a plastic bag when they tie them up in a plastic bag in most places that renders them unrecyclable by the facilities, that's the number one thing that we go after chairwoman. So I, I put it in design and consumer behavior. Right. Well, we're, we're educating the public here, here today. Um, <laughs> and, and also, um, you know, just wondering how, um, how have plastics in today's waste streams changed since the development of the resin identification codes from 30 years ago, which are commonly identified on plastic packaging by a number one through seven in a triangle. So one of the things that we're looking at here today is what additional research is needed for better plastic characterization and how could that research yield new standards and identification codes and uh you know miss harrison if you have anything to contribute on that i'd love to hear from you as well as uh dr keolian whose research was also speaking to this well, quickly, I'd say that those resident identification codes determine the or indicate the materials past, not the indicate the materials future. They do not automatically uh, determine that something is recyclable, even if it has a one. It doesn't automatically mean so. It uh, better research into how we communicate to the public with confidence that yes, this was designed for the solution and uh, for the system and that the system meets it in the middle, the system can take this, I think uh, would be much a much needed solution. But uh, I'll turn it over to Dr. Keolian. Yeah, I would agree. Um, the uh, identification is critical to help with, with sorting, but I think that uh, other systems are, are necessary to facilitate the, the sorting. And we, we should really also look at transfer transferability of models that are successful. As you know, uh, in the state of Michigan, we have a bottle build. Um, and so we have very uh, higher uh, quality in terms of our recycled uh, containers due to the uh, redemption rates that we have here compared to other states that don't have those bottle bills. So we have to really look holistically at our solutions. No, which is which is part of what we're um, also symbolizing here today with uh, the the great panelists. So I'm I'm out of time. I'm I'm now going to recognize the the gentleman from the nice state of Florida who who is right. Those beaches, you know, us Michiganders. Not maybe at this time of year we're racing to, but there are certainly points of, of time in the year where my constituents are either in Florida or looking to get to Florida. I'll see so you in January. Yeah. So with yeah. that, Mr. Waltz. <laughs> yeah. No. Thank you so much, Chairwoman. Hey, Dr. Hill Myers, I mentioned during my visit, um, or I mentioned during my own statement, my uh, visit to the Loggerhead Marine Life Center. I saw the, you know, the the damaging impacts of microplastics uh, in our environment and in our food supply. Do you think that biodegradable plastics would be would be beneficial? It seems to me, you know, it could be a um, a bit of a, a game changer. Uh, in addressing the, the challenge of microplastics? And if so, what challenges to adopting more biodegradable plastics do you see? Congressman, thank you for, for the question. Um, this is a, a challenging question because of uh, definitions of, of biodegradable uh, that are present. Uh, biodegradable over what time frame and under what conditions? I firmly believe that biodegradable plastics will be uh, a piece of the plastics puzzle 
in that development of materials that can be assimilated by microorganisms uh, in either engineered environments, such as industrial composting uh, and places like that, or if uh, escaped into the environment um, indiscriminately, um, they could end up then biodegrading over some lifetime. The issue becomes is how do we really understand the fundamental processes of biodegradation, biodegradation over what time scale and under what conditions that biodegradation takes place? Um, I think we want to be careful about uh, plastics that are um, uh, labeled as biodegradable as maybe incentivizing, you, you know, leaving them in the environment. That's one thing we have to be careful about. Um, but I do think that with proper, for example, compost infrastructure and proper understanding and education around this issue is that biodegradable plastics will play a role in the future sustainable polymers. One example would be, as we spoke about before, is in food contaminated uh, plastics. So, for example, if those plastics were uh, compostable, they could go in compostable food waste, provided the infrastructure uh, was available. So the answer is a little more uh, complicated and nuanced, but I will uh, end by saying, yes, that it is a piece of the plastics puzzle, how we will solve it. Biodegradable polymers will play a role. Yeah, thank you. And the answers always seem to be much more complex than than most people, uh, than most people, including this committee, fully appreciates. Um, Mr. Baca, we discussed uh, that China has banned uh, the import of plastic recycling for processing from the United States and many other countries. Uh, the claim is that it's due to the poor quality of the plastic bundles being imported. Uh, do you agree? Do you believe that that or one, do you agree? And do you believe that China has other ambitions uh, behind the recent ban? If so, what do you think they are? Uh, and, um, you know, I just have to ask more broadly, uh, what would it mean uh, for the U.S. if we were to completely cede leadership to China in advanced recycling? Congressman, thank you so much for that question. And, and I 100 percent agree with you. We should not be ceding leadership on the issue of advanced recycling to any country right now. I think when you get to the issue of contamination, the biggest challenge we have right now is really a fragmented system where you have 9,000 jurisdictions across the United States doing 9,000 different things. I think there's a very appropriate role for Congress here to develop a set of minimum standards that work to improve recycling access, recycling education, recycling outreach, and recycling collection. That will definitely streamline the processes um, to getting more plastics and all material, frankly, into the system. I think when it comes to the issue of advanced recycling, um, the good news that I want to share with this committee is that advanced recycling is actually being built at a commercial scale. The fundamentals that have guided the market development of advanced recycling continue to change, and there have been tremendous breakthroughs in advanced recycling that allow us to capture all plastic materials, turn them into virgin quality plastics, and reuse them again and again and again. You know, there's um, a couple of examples that I would give you, you know, a pouch, something that you use to get your food that's now recyclable because of a breakthroughs in advanced recycling. Fo foam food containers is another great example of what that breakthrough is. The point is, this technology is not static. Um, it evolves over time. And the work that this committee is doing and laying the foundation to ensure our global leadership is one I highly commend your work for. Oh, thank you for that, and I, and I agree. I think that is an appropriate role for uh, for Congress, uh, and but then also that that, that education piece. Uh, I can tell you, my own family, we get confused on what is recyclable, what is not. I'm an avid recycler. I hate the waste, uh, but it is difficult to figure out, even going from back and forth from D.C. and various places in Florida. So I think those are uh, absolutely appropriate roles, and I look forward to working with this committee to um, uh, to move the ball forward. I yield my time. Um, and with that, we're we're going to recognize our next um, member for five minutes of questioning. It it looks like we might be moving to Mr. Buyer for five minutes of questioning. You are now <laughs> recognized. Oh, okay. Wait, pardon me. Is Tonko sitting right here? So, so we're we're on the screen. We're going to, Don, we're going to, we're going to hold on you and we're going to recognize my good friend from the great state of New York, Mr. Paul Tonka. Thank you, Madam Chair. And first things first, happy birthday. 
And great to see your mom in the uh, audience in the, vir not the virtual setting, but the real setting, since she had a major role to play in the celebration, the annual celebration. Uh, we say thank you to her for delivering a great member of Congress. Um, so I thank you for holding today's hearing and for your efforts to advance solutions to address our growing plastic waste problem. Today, America's recycling systems face exponentially greater volumes of plastic waste with more complex and multi-layered plastic products than it was ever designed to handle. Even as the U.S. recycling market has grown more broadly, our plastic recycling systems have not kept pace. And when these systems are overwhelmed, we risk environmental damage, hard to clean pollution, and most importantly, grave danger to human health. We need swift and bold action at both ends of this problem, making investments in recycling R&D with strong oversight of those programs, while also focusing individually as a society uh, and as a, as a government on the urgent need to reduce the amount of plastic waste that we do indeed generate in the first place. So when it comes to R&D, several federal agencies carry out R&D and standards development programs related to plastics recycling, material substitutes, and data gathering. However, I was astonished to learn that there is currently no coordinated effort to facilitate multi-agency collaboration to reduce plastic waste and improve recycling R&D. So Dr. Keolian, what do you think the role of the federal government should be in supporting cross-cutting R&D and innovation necessary to address our plastic waste reduction and recycling challenges? That, that is an excellent question. And uh, clearly there needs to be uh, coordination in terms of this R&D through the federal government so that we can most efficiently use our R&D resources uh, to target the most uh, significant challenges and, and uh, bottlenecks in, in our system. And uh, I really recommend, we, we developed this first characterization. You may have seen the spaghetti diagram of the flow of plastics through the economy from production to use markets to end of life. Uh, but it is, uh, some of the areas are incomplete. We don't have data in certain areas to understand what resins are going into what systems. So I, I first recommend that we really uh, do a, a more in-depth characterization of the different resins, end uses and end of life management strategies so we understand uh, fully the problem. And then uh, the solutions really need to be looked at uh, in, in so that we can develop infrastructure that's gonna deal with um, you know, long lived products like buildings and automobiles versus packaging. So I, I, I think that we, uh, through a characterization of the streams, um, can then decide which uh, types of materials we want to go after and what end use products. And so coordination is, is definitely key. And I think that um, uh, starting out with a, an overall um, accounting of the problem will, will facilitate better use of resources. Thank you. And Dr. Hillmeyer, I'm very concerned about the climate impacts of plastic production, which are primarily caused by the use of fossil fuel feedstocks. What environmental uh, benefits, such as lower emissions from production, are associated with your work in developing alternatives to uh, fossil fuel-based plastics? Congressman, thank you for the question. Uh, it's pretty clear that uh, turning to renewable resources for plastics will ultimately be the future uh, in the long run. And the research associated with how to efficiently convert those materials from annually renewable resources like plants that sequester CO2 is really of high priority. The, the bottom line is, is that the ability to convert sugars from plants to chemicals that we can ultimately use in the manufacture of plastics, uh, it requires fundamental research to support new technologies that stem from that because you're competing with an industry uh, that is very efficient uh, and, uh, uh, has, has many uh, efficiencies associated with the conversion of fossil resources. So we work on the center in trying to understand how to use renewable resources, how to convert them efficiently into molecules that have utility in the polymer and plastics uh, arena. Um, the basic research is coming along, and, but more effort is needed to make it both technologically and economically competitive uh, with petrochemically derived materials. 
Thank you so much. And with that, I say welcome, Maria Marcotte, and thank you, Chair Stevens. I yield back. Well, thank you so much. You really are the sweetest friend, Mr. Tonko. Uh, and with that, allow me uh, to recognize uh, my colleague from o Ohio, who's just been a, a really uh, great collaborator on this work, Mr. Gonzalez. Thank you, Madam Chair. Happy birthday. And uh, thank you to our witnesses for being here today and, and for your expertise. Uh, I agree. Congress must get to work on ways to accelerate innovation in plastics and battery recycling, reduce the environmental impact of their consumption, and increase the economic value and security of domestic resources and supply chains. Uh, recycling and innovations in recycling need to be a key part of addressing the climate challenge as Mr. Hillmeyer just uh, discussed. It is of critical importance that we consider a comprehensive government approach to spur innovations through R&D and coordination across relevant federal agencies on the work. Uh, that's why I was proud to join the chairwoman in introducing the Plastics Waste Reduction and Recycling Research Act, uh, this Congress, and applaud her leadership on this issue. Uh, it's also important to recognize the unique role of the Department of Energy and its national labs in enabling next generation research in plastics optimization and advanced recycling. Uh, Mr. Bach, I want to start with you. Uh, in, in your prepared remarks, you describe ACC's work with DOE and its national labs. So my question is, how is the Department of Energy's Office of Science uniquely positioned to conduct research to solve challenges in this space? Congressman, thank you so much for that question. Um, let me start off by saying this, um, all in regards to the comments about the climate challenge, first off, plastics overall have a much lower carbon footprint than any other material. Um, they have been critical, as I mentioned in my statement, to um, lightweighting vehicles and insulating our homes. And some of the work that we're doing with the Department of Energy and our national labs really focus on that ability to understand the life cycle of plastic materials and ensure that um, we, we understand its impact uh, on the environment. Um, that work is currently happening. We've been working with a variety of, of the national laboratories, Argonne National Laboratory, for instance, we work with the Department of Energy on their Plastics Innovation Challenge. The key thing is that this work is happening right now. Um, we are working with some of the, the leading scientists in the world um, to uh, examine and, and research the best ways to recover, reuse, and recycle more of our plastic materials. So I commend the work the committee is doing. Our industry is, is happy to be working with this. There's a critical role for the Department of Energy. There's also a critical role for the national labs um, to ensuring that we study the best uses for plastic recycling going forward. Thank you. And then as a follow-up, is, is there anything that should be done to facilitate more effective use of DOE's work by other stakeholders or other agencies? And are there mechanisms needed to promote more public-private partnerships uh, through these programs? Absolutely. We could always be doing more to promote more public-private partnerships. Many of us on this meeting today, um, our organization collaborates very often with groups like the Recycling Partnership, the Alliance and Plastic Waste, Closed Loop Partners, um, to name a few, to create a circular system here. Um, that private-public partnership is, is an excellent model in the sense that we are able to capture more plastic and collaborate on solutions. The work being done by DOE and the um, the, the national labs, for instance, those findings should further inform uh, the work we're doing. Um, so yes, I think we uh, part of the, the work I think this committee can do is connect those dots to bring the stakeholders together. To solve the problem of plastic waste, it's gonna require a tremendous amount of collaboration. Not one industry is gonna solve it. It's gonna require collaboration across the entire plastics value chain. It's gonna require collaboration with the scientists and engineers, the national labs, government NGOs, um, um, and so, yes, connecting those dots, I think, would be a very critical first step for that work. Great. And then my final question for you. Um, so there's sometimes some false narratives about advanced recycling. Uh, could you discuss how important advanced recycling and innovative technologies will be to addressing the climate challenge? 100%. Um, advanced recycling is a critical component to solving the plastic waste challenge. Um, we are developing advanced recycling technology at a commercial scale. One of our member companies, Eastman Chemical, is building a plastic to plastic facility in Tennessee that's going to cost about $250 million. Um, it's critical because what advanced recycling does is it takes very difficult, hard to recycle plastic. Think, for instance, a pouch that is uh, manufactured today to keep your food fresh. That is light. It requires less water produced. It's easy to transport from a carbon perspective, but it's very difficult to recycle from a mechanical perspective. Advanced recycling takes those types of items, 
breaks them down to their chemical building block and creates a virgin quality plastic that allows it to go into very demanding applications like food contact, pharmaceutical and medical. And advanced recycling is gonna be key as part of that comprehensive strategy that the Congresswoman from Texas mentioned that all of the above strategy we need to solve the plastic waste problem. Fantastic. Well, thank you for that. Uh, thank you to our witnesses again and to Madam Chair. And I yield back. And, and with that, we'll now recognize uh, Mr. Beyer from the Commonwealth of Virginia. Thank you, Madam Chair, very much. And I want to thank your mother for doing the hard work 29 years ago of giving birth to you. So I'm glad she's here with you today on your birthday. Um, I, I, I want to say that I am very supportive of this act and I'm all in on more research and development. And I do, do believe that there's better living through chemistry, but I also think the elephant in the room is why not less plastics? We seem to spend an awful lot of time talking about recycling and putting plastics together, but uh, our colleague Alan Lowenthal from Long Beach has a, a banning single use plastics bill. Um, there are now 69 countries that have banned plastic bags. There are at least a dozen that have banned microbeads, including the United States and the UK. Now, Dr. Keolian, I know you're all about sustainability. Is there not, are, are we not missing a big piece of this just by thinking about better ways to use less plastics? Yes, um, you make a very good uh, point uh, and observation. Um, we really need to look holistically at solving our problems in terms of providing goods and services economically and sustainably. And yes, plastics do afford benefits of light weighting and safety, um, you know, protecting products. But there is, you know, we do really need to look at what we do in life cycle assessment is look at the impacts in production, use, and retirement, and evaluate the total energy, greenhouse gas emissions, and waste. And there are definitely opportunities today where we could substitute materials, use more uh, durable uh, solutions, uh, and reduce you know, the use of plastics. Uh, plastics clearly have a critical role in our society, but I think we could be smarter um, with substitutions. And because if we just focus on recycling, um, we could actually increase the proliferation of plastics and actually make recycling more challenging and the volumes could go up, which means more resources. So as you know, we are in a climate crisis. We need to, a different calculus about how we uh, look at sustainable systems and solutions. And, and so I think it's really critical that when we evaluate uh, innovations in recycling infrastructure, we look from a life cycle lens. And, um, you know, plastics are carbon intensive. There are other materials that are less carbon intensive, but they are, you know, they do offer advantages. Uh, but you get these trade offs. Uh, that occur, and it's important to use a systems approach to address it. Yeah, sometimes even just little things like you see on the Capitol Hill, many members will carry around the big, you know, 32 ounce or 64 ounce water bottles, which is a huge improvement over buying yet another uh, water bottle, you know, uh, a dozen at a time. Ms. Harrison, you, you have a background in ocean plastics, among other things. And uh, which is just scares the dickens out of me. The Great Pacific Garbage Patch is twice the size of Texas. And that's one of only five major garbage patches in the world. Um, and I just read we have up to 2 million tons of plastics per year entering the ocean through our rivers. What are we going to do to address this? Well, I think it gets back to your first question. I agree that recycling will not solve this. Recycling is part of a circular economy, but it is not the solution. Recycling is a reaction. Recycling only happens when there's a big enough pile that someone can turn into something new. If we wait for that pile to accumulate in the ocean, we have missed our opportunity to prevent it from happening in the first place. Yeah, I started off by studying turtles. And a couple of years ago, I was on a research ship that took corporate execs and actually my biologist uh, my lead biologist instructor from college, she joined me on this trip because I said, don't you want to join corporate executives in the middle of the ocean to see the plastics up front and the Sargasso Sea? And we 
we jumped in the middle of the water. We jumped in the Atlantic Ocean, 50 kilometers east of Bermuda, and we saw the microplastics, but we also saw macro. We saw fishing gear, we saw toilet seats, we saw sporks. If we wait for sporks to be in the middle of the Sargasso Sea, we have waited too long. We have to talk about a system solution that takes into concepts, that takes R&D concepts and marries them to economics. I love this conversation about cross-agency collaboration. We must think about it from a system point of view so we prevent the problem, not just clean up the problem. Thank you very much. And I yield back, Madam Chair. Great. And, and with that, allow me to recognize um, my, my friend and colleague, Dr. Baird, for five minutes of questioning. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, again, happy birthday. Uh, Ranking Member Waltz and our witnesses, we really appreciate uh, all of you being here. And I really appreciate Ms. Harrison mentioning the Hollywood of Indiana that makes outdoor furnitures out of detergent bottles. And then just last week, I spoke to the ERI, which is the Electronic Recyclers International, a company located in my district which specializes in electronics recycling. And while yes, this hearing pertains to and focuses on the plastic recycling, I believe that some of the themes remain the same when we view recycling at a global level. And this is an issue that you mentioned in your testimony, uh, Dr. Keolian. Uh, the United States exports waste to developing countries, uh, which excludes both plastics and electronics waste. I discussed the national security and the counterfeiting which occurs from exporting electronics waste, but that is but one issue. And as such countries also present severe environmental harm by improperly impo disposing of these materials, uh, that being plastics as well as the electronics. Realistically, um, what's happening when such countries import these plastics? And is there anything that we can be doing to help in the disposal and make sure it's handled properly? Dr. Keolian. Yeah, so um, one thing, just focusing on electronic waste, um, I know the GAO did a study um, and showed that there is a lot of illegal activity of exporting waste, hazardous waste. And so one uh, activity that, that uh, Congress could do is, is strengthen um, the auditing and uh, you know, crack down more on this illegal activity uh, because that, that is posing problems in terms of you know, uh, hazardous waste and how they're managed improperly in developing countries. So, um, and then we've talked about you know, setting up the infrastructure here so we're not exporting. I think we, we need to take responsibility, total producer responsibility in terms of how our products are managed at end of life. And, and we can't rely on exporting. And I think that there's a recognition that we also wanna have leadership in setting up the systems uh, to be able to uh, properly manage uh, products like uh, electronics um, to reduce risk. So I think one accountability in terms of, of uh, enforcement of the current regulations that we have on electronics waste would go a long ways. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, Dr. Hilmar, uh, in your testimony, you suggest bio-based fuels. I'm changing direction here a little bit. You suggest that bio-based products uh, would make for promising materials to use in place of some of the traditional ma manufacturing materials. And so with my ag background, I'm interested uh, in how agriculture might play a role in solving some of these um, issues and provide the raw materials for making alternative materials that would function for the same purpose. So do you have any uh, comments in that regard? Congressman, thank you. Ab absolutely. Um, there's really, uh, I, I spoke about in my testimony, bio-based uh, products um, and the idea that you would use annually renewable crops to generate uh, not only new chemicals, uh, Congressman, but actually incumbent chemicals that could be drop-in replacements for petroleum-based materials, I think is an active and important uh, area of research. Um, 
one area that is, uh, I think, important uh, now is the ability to use non-nutritive biomass. You know, you can imagine grasses and woody biomass so that there's no disruption of the, of the food chain. But of course, it turns out that it's a lot easier to process things like uh, corn and sugar beets and other um, uh, materials that have sugars that are more readily accessible uh, to fermentation processes, for example. That basic research and that fundamental understanding of how to convert those bio-based resources into both new chemicals and drop-in replacements uh, is in need of more effort and more research to make these things technologically viable. In the fullness of time, uh, using, like I said, non-nutritive biomass, I think is a really, uh, a really important goal uh, for the industry. Thank you. And uh, I see I'm out of time, so I yield back, Madam Chair. Perfectly on time. And, and with that, the chair is going to recognize uh, Dr. Bill Foster uh, for five minutes of questioning. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, now, well, Mr. Baca, first off, thank you for your shout out to Argonne National Labs, uh, not only because I represent Argonne, but it's really a perfect example, you know, the research you cited of why this committee is committed on a bipartisan basis to doubling DOE's budget across the full range of its mission. It's just one small but important part. Um, so my question to anyone that that uh, wants to try, um, what do you do with high performance plastics? You know, how do you deal with plastics that have you know, glass fibers for structural strength or colorants or carbon black, you know, are, are there classes of really high performance plastics, you know, high temperature thermosets like, you know, polyamides like Kapton, epoxies and so on, for which there really is not going to be a re realistic recycling scenario or maybe short of pyrolyzing them? Um, you know, what, what, you know, what fraction of the current and potential market is this? Should we just focus on the generic plastics and acknowledge that there's a, there's a, some classes of hopefully low volume plastics that are just going to be really tough and we should at least for now give up on them. Anyone want to take a stab uh, at Congressman, I, I don't mind taking a stab at least at the, some aspect of it. I think you have a, a, an important point in that high performance uh, materials, for example, composite materials uh, certainly have uh, challenges associated with how to uh, recycle them. But the contemporary research in this arena, uh, in the thermoset arena, let me just address one of them, is actually going on at the, at the Center for Sustainable Polymers, is that how do you able to uh, reprocess these materials? Thermosets, as you may know, are typically viewed as um, unreprocessable, uh, but current research in dynamic exchange of covalent bonds allows for these materials to be reprocessed in ways that were uh, not uh, available before. So while recycling, um, biodegradation, and other aspects of uh, solving this plastic waste dilemma are important, I do think um, uh, reuse and repurposing and reprocessing of materials uh, could play a role. And they may be very well come along with the composite materials and, as you say, fiberglass that's in there. I'll end by saying that Yes, these are a smaller portion of our plastics waste dilemma. Uh, I do not think we should ignore it, but I think there are more pressing issues in, for example, the more common and ubiquitous pl plastic packaging. Does anyone want to say, um, yeah, I mean, how do you view the future of this? Is it going, are we going to go more and more to solvent uh, type recycling or, you know, what? What are the future technologies or just do a really good job with mechanical separation with robotics? And, you know, what, what are the, the technologies that are going to end up being important in this? Ben, well, well, Congressman, I'll take a shot at that. I mean, I think some of the work that I talked about in regards to advanced recycling right now is largely focused on plastic packaging. But there's no doubt that we can learn from some of those breakthroughs to see how we scale it across a variety of other industries. Um, we, as the plastics industry, represent a variety of companies that do a variety of things in this space. One key area that our companies are really focused in on is helping create a low carbon future by lightweighting vehicles and making them more energy efficient. Um, we have been working, we've already outlined a roadmap that deals with the issue of circularity in the automotive space. And um, it's gonna require a lot more effort by work on this committee and by government agencies to really think about that R&D aspect of it. Um, because what we're doing right now is we're, we're solving an issue from a carbon perspective, 
but we now need to think about how we make these materials more sustainable and reutilize them over and over and over again. I was speaking to a sustainability fellow at Ford and you know, even thinking about their vision a little bit is with the electrification of cars and autonomous vehicles, for instance, you know, those parts are valuable. They have a high value that can be used again and again. So um, there's no doubt that more work needs to be done. My hope would be that some of the work and the breakthroughs on uh, things like advanced recycling um, could eventually extend into some of these other applications. Yeah. So it's I, I think it's in Germany where they actually have very serious requirements on recyclability for cars they're manufacturing. Is that um, a correct remembrance of some story I've seen? Um, you know, I guess you know, you're, you're talking about the dream of having you know, cars that are assembled by robots at the factories. And then at the end of their life, they drive back to the factory and the same robots that put them together, take them apart and, and separate them, melt down the plastic parts and cast them into new pieces. You know, that sort of is an ultimate endpoint. But the, the Germans, I thought, were actually making some requirements already on cars. I, I don't know off the top of my head, Congressman, and we could uh, definitely get that submitted for the record. But I think your point is spot on, just what you said. If you think of a futuristic world here um, and the manufacturing of vehicles, that, that vision you outlined is one that I think we wholeheartedly subscribe to. The material is super valuable and has tremendous value. It's not waste. And if we could capture that material break it down to its, its building blocks and reuse it again. That's not just good for the environment. It's a sustainable product. It reduces our reliance on natural resources and it's gonna create circularity and sustainability across a variety of industries. Yep. And all the leftover parts won't have motor oil sprayed all over. I guess my time <laughs> is up, <laughs> so I'll yield back. Okay. Thank you, Congressman. Thanks, and, and now the chair will recognize um, the, the Congressman from Michigan. Peter Meyer for five minutes of questioning. Thank you, Madam Chair. And, and once again, on behalf of a fellow member of the Michigan delegation, happy birthday. Um, just wanted to, again, uh, thank um, both our, our ranking member and our, our chair for hosting this subcommittee hearing. Um, and I, I think it's an incredibly important topic uh, and one that in West Michigan uh, we care deeply about. We have uh, two landfills in our largest county, Kent County, um, one of which is nearing the end of its life cycle. And I'm proud to say that our um, our county and, and local officials are looking at ways of turning it into a sustainable business park in order to recapture the value stream that right now is being disposed of. And I want to um, also appreciate the ranking members remarks on the idea of a circular economy and what we can do to really close down some of those waste streams. Um, and obviously single use plastics is a major, a main one. Um, the plastics that are not getting recycled that are recyclable are also incredibly significant. But ever since the 2018 national sword policy by China, um, we lost one of our most valuable output mechanisms and sorting mechanisms for dealing with that commingled um, but recyclable waste. Um, you know, we also have a very strong plastics industry in our third district that supports thousands of jobs um, and in the chemical industry and auto manufacturing um, and even in the packaging of, of breakfast cereals at Battle Creek in my district, Cereal City, USA. Uh, so plastics plays a vital role. Um, you know, I guess one of my questions first for Mr. Baca, um, as we're thinking about single use plastics and, and compostable plastics coming on board. And I know we've spoken about some of the difficulties of, um, or just the, the contamination that can occur when uh, compostable or biodegradable plastics are introduced into a recyclable plastic stream. Um, I guess, are there, what are the opportunities to be shifting those single use applications into a biodegradable or compostable alternative? Oh, Congressman, thank you for that question. And I think both of those are part of that all of the above solution that uh, the Congresswoman from Texas mentioned here. Uh, I think the key point that I would uh, mention regarding this, and this kind of cuts across a variety of comments that were already made today, innovation is going to be what wins the day on solving this problem, not bans and not more regulation. Innovation on how we deal with compostability, innovation on how we deal with biodegradability, innovation on how we create a circular economy for plastics where we're using valuable material over and over again. That is what circularity is. 
What that will ultimately create is a low carbon future that all of us want, because it will require us using less natural resources to create these products. So to your to the specific point of your question, I think this goes back to the overarching theme of what this committee is talking about today. More work is needed. We need to think and leverage the best of what we have, whether it's the Department of Energy, whether it's our national labs, whether it's the Commerce Department, all of these agencies play a very critical role in connecting the research dots to ensure that science guides the expansion of things like biodegradability, research guides the things like compostability, and collaboration continues to guide the work around circularity. Thank you, Mr. Baca. And, and, and Dr. Uh, Kiulian, um, I really enjoyed reading your testimony, and it's good to welcome a witness from the Great Lakes State. Um, I should note that your professorship at the University of Michigan is named for Peter Wege, uh, who was a son of West Michigan and directed much of his energy and philanthropy into environmental causes. Uh, he coined the term economicology, combining economy and ecology. So very much a believer that um, you know we need to be caring for the environment, but doing so in a way that is economically ultimately beneficial, which I, I believe conservatism, um, or sorry, conservationism, but also conservatism are. You know, using Peter Wege's lens, uh, how should Congress be approaching that life cycle of plastic materials to have maximum benefit for the economy? Um, well, in addition to looking at uh, life cycle assessment of energy and greenhouse gas emissions, we also look at life cycle costs. And, um, you know, one example, we did a study on for the state of Oregon on uh, bottled water versus uh, reusable systems. And clearly there's, uh, you know, using tap water and, and filling a container is gonna be much more economical than using a disposable bottle. And, um, you know, this and the, the energy savings and the waste is significantly different. So um, we need to be smart and really look at, when we look at solutions, we do need to look at the economics. And I believe we also need to look at certain uh, regulations and standards uh, because it's not just going to be innovation. I think it's critical that we take an interdisciplinary approach and, and bring together the economics, policy, technology, and behavior. Thank you, Madam Chair. My time has expired, and I yield back. Great questions. And with that, the, the chair is now going to recognize the Congresswoman from the nice state of North Carolina, Congresswoman Ross. Well, thank you very much, Chairwoman Stevens, and I hope this is a very, very happy birthday for you. Um, I also want to thank our witnesses for joining us today on this extremely important issue that affects people's everyday lives. In my home state of North Carolina, we're one of the top plastic producers in the country. As of 2019, we were ranked in the top 10 in the country in terms of number of employees in the plastics industry with over 38,000 employees. But we've also played an important role in plastic waste reduction and recycling innovation. In 2009, when I served in the North Carolina State Legislature, we were facing serious issues with litter and sea turtle, sea turtle deaths along the Outer Banks, one of the most pristine parts of our state. In response, we passed a law that banned single-use plastic bags in six counties along the Outer Banks. While this law was generally supported in those communities, it was repealed in 2017. In addition, we have researchers at, the, at North Carolina State University in my district who have been involved in plastic waste reduction and recycling research. In addition to the, the company previously mentioned, um, one graduate of NC State's College of Textiles, Bill Johnston, went on to found a sustainable clothing company that converts plastic bottles into fiber that is spun into yarn, knitted into fabric, and sewn into clothing. Um, and I focus a lot in my when, in my questions about the next generation because we're such a STEM focused um, area of the country. And so, um, to all the witnesses, I want to um, ask you how we inspire the next generation to get involved in STEM fields, to be excited about recycling and not using plastics in the first place. We've seen so much leadership 
from the next generation about climate issues and about things like recycling. Um, beyond teaching kids in schools, how can we better encourage them to pursue education and careers um, like you all have? I would be happy to jump in. And as a graduate of a North Carolina University, UNCG, I'm I'm happy to practice this research. Um, I my degree was in human ecology and natural resources, how we put this all together. And that's what I want to look for as I'm inspiring young people and young diverse people to be involved. When we think of how we engage kids into this space, I think we often think about campaigns. We've all seen those. What we really need is to spark the innovation of our youth into looking to the system solution that we keep talking about. We can't just R&D our way out. We can't just look for a singular technology. We have to really think about pivoting from how do we respond to the problem to how do we prevent it from the first place? How do we know from the very concept of design, whether it's an advanced plastic material like we were just talking about or a packaging, we know whether it's gonna be linear, a landfill, or circular, that it can become something else. That is the work that the Recycling Partnership is doing to advance diversity in the space, um, to bring young minds to think about it uh, holistically. I think I'm going to move on to my next question so that I can get another one in. But if somebody wants to amplify, um, please, please do so. So this one's for Dr. Hillmeyer. Last month, the Department of Energy announced investments of up to $14.5 million for R&D to cut waste and reduce energy use to recycle single-use plastics. How does your research group and other, others working on chemical recycling technology integrate a sustainable chemistry or green approach with your research in order to design ways to minimize or neutralize any potential harmful byproducts of the chemical recycling process. Thank you, Congresswoman. We work hard on this, uh, we'll call it advanced recycling in the subset of chemical uh, recycling, and really trying to understand the fundamentals of how you can take established plastics and ones that we design on purpose to be efficiently chemically recycled in let's and we we commented on the uh, about use of solvent in green chemistry ways that don't require a solvent that require things like maybe temperature or light that allow you to turn plastics that are useful in their everyday application efficiently back to the molecules from which they came using the principles of green chemistry. If we can do that, those new molecules can then be gener can generate virgin plastic that has the same, the same benefit. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I yield back. Great, and um, with that, we're gonna recognize um, Mr. Connor Lamb, Congressman from the nice state of Pennsylvania for five minutes of questioning. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, yes, we are nice, so nice, in fact, that uh, on behalf of the whole state, we'd like to wish you a happy birthday today as well. Um, to our witnesses, thank you for hanging on this long. Uh, Dr. Hillmeyer, I kind of wanted to pick up where I think you were leaving off, uh, which is that, of course, our jurisdiction on this committee really is to try to move forward the nation's research agenda and help answer kind of unanswered questions. Uh, particularly ones of a longer term nature that that individual businesses might find profitable to answer on their own. Could, so w would you mind just kind of summarizing or commenting on uh, the state of knowledge about where we're going in composting um, and uh, the breakdown of, you know, so-called biodegradable uh, recyclables and plastics um, and and maybe give me a little bit more specific insight and uh, into it, you know, if there's two or three big questions that that we can really help answer, say, in the next decade, what are they? Thank you, Congressman. Uh, this is an area that I'm quite uh, passionate about and, and very interested in. And uh, I'll reiterate what I said earlier, uh, is this word biodegradation, over what time frame, under what conditions? And I think this is where the basic research plays a key role, is understanding exactly what happens, let's say, in industrial compost at high temperature and high humidity, as opposed to maybe backyard compost or in the environment. Um, and how to differentiate the chemistries and differentiate the fundamental processes that go on uh, in those different environments so you can understand and predict the lifetimes of these materials in the environment. The second piece that's important, I think, is what do they break down to 
And how do we understand we're not just generating, for example, smaller shards of plastic that are recalcitrant? Uh, and so following it all the way through the breakdown process and understanding both the physical phenomena and the chemical phenomena are, are critically uh, important. And we have research in the center that's really trying to understand those fundamental processes. How do microorganisms break down what um, ultimately results from, let's say, the hydrolysis or biodegradation of compostable plastics? Um, I, I, I view this, again, as a piece of the solution uh, to plastic uh, waste, but it will come with infrastructure and clear education and understanding of what is meant by compostable and how the processes actually uh, take place. I think this is a really important contemporary uh, area of research. Um, more research is needed to understand the design factors, what you might build into the plastic to have it break down under certain conditions in efficient ways. And I love the idea of a systems approach where it's design of molecules, evaluate performance, end of life uh, scenarios that allow a complete life cycle to be, uh, to be understood at a, at a very fundamental level. Uh, well, I very much appreciate that, and I think Chairwoman's bill will certainly help us advance toward that goal. Um, do any of our other witnesses want to um, want to answer my question in the minute 50 I have remaining of just kind of clarifying the specific question that you would like to see us help answer in the next decade or so? Uh, Oops. I'll say quickly that I would encourage this committee to, when they think about composting, I very often hear people thinking about composting because recycling, the to-do list for recycling seems hard. When we get, when we begin to pivot to what else, we have to ask ourselves, is the to-do list for making plastics compostable even longer? Currently, 4% of the U.S. population have access to that commercial composting. That's significantly less than who have access to traditional recycling. So I want to make sure that we're not pivoting to something because the, the current problem seems hard, but instead pulling back and saying, how do we, from the very concept of the idea, make sure that we have a good solution? Dr. Keolian. Yeah, I would just add that, you know, we think of composting as very positive, you know, you know, we backyard compost or I compost in my house. I put that compost into my garden. It's a soil amendment. But what we're talking about here is really dealing with litter, avoiding the litter. And it's really, the, it's a lost resource. You know, this is plastic that has, you know, embodied energy in it, and we're just dissipating it into the environment to deal with a litter problem. So I really think we got to look critically at what we want to make compostable. Um, it, it's, so I think, you know, we're really, again, it's back to holistic solutions. You know, having- Well, I really appreciate the- uh, If we can get the chairwoman's bill passed, uh, it will certainly move us down the road to answering some of that. So appreciate your presence and your insights. And uh, Madam Chairwoman, I yield back. Well, thank you. And um, what a nice note to, to begin to close the hearing out on, um, because it's it's true. We've got a, a tremendous piece of legislation and the, this hearing uh, was the, the kickoff for this legislative session to really make sure that we're on the right track and hearing from stakeholders from across the spectrum, um, you know, with Mr. Baca being from the American Chemistry Council that if you heard in his testimony and I'll repeat it again, is very dedicated to the, you know, all hands on deck uh, approach and also bringing in the, the expertise that we need to hear from to, to Keith Harrison, who, you know, just has her finger on the pulse of what's going on across the country. And Dr. Mark Hillmeyer, who I, I feel like I could, you know, along with Dr. Keolian, you're just wealth of knowledge and, and dedication, um, both with Keolian, Mr. Dr. Keolian at the Weggie School, who is Mr. Meyer referenced is, you know, just was a, an American hero and so dedicated to our state of Michigan, both sides of the state of Michigan. And, um, you know, M M Dr. Hillmeyer, sometimes people confuse Michigan and Minnesota, but we know you're on the other side of the lake, <laughs> you know, a couple, a couple of other sides of the lake. So, um, and then we can debate who, who really is the land of many, many lakes. Um, but, but we really are, are grateful for your, your dedicated research and your, your time today. And, and, 
and where we find ourselves in this legislative session is, you know, really at, um, I, I think, the tipping point of something tremendous. We call today's hearing um, moving from staggering statistics, if you recall share, hearing me share, that just 9% of our recycling, um, it, it, 9% of our plastics is, is, is recycled. How do we increase that? I mean, how do we even begin to think about doubling that to sustainable systems? And the systems component, right, moving from staggering statistics to sustainable systems is is so important because we hear about, you know, the individual enthusiasm and the consumer enthusiasm. And even as uh, Ms. Ross was referencing in her questions and, and, and what she's seeing in her district in North Carolina with individual entrepreneurs and business leaders, but we really do need a systems approach. And this also comes as a unique time as the United States is, is charting a path forward on our broader infrastructure as, as well. And okay, it does was filibustering here. A, a colleague from another a colleague from the nice state of Pennsylvania, uh, Congresswoman Susan Wild, has come in for questions. So allow me to pause on my preamble and recognize her for five minutes of questioning. Uh, well, Ms. Wild. <laughs> thank, thank you, Madam Chair. And I'm sorry to come in late. I'm juggling three committees this morning. So we all know how, how that goes. And so I'm just going to keep it short, but I, I've been listening to as much of this hearing as I possibly could because it's an interest of great, it's a topic of great personal interest to me. Um, and so what I really just like, I'll, I'll just throw this out there to Dr. Keolian. Um, a recent study concluded that large amounts of plastic would accumulate in the environment, even if we use every currently feasible effort to achieve an 80% reduction in plastic pollution by 2040. Um, you and other experts agree that designing materials for recyclability will be key to sustainable plastic waste reduction. What steps do we need to take to ensure coordination between product design and options for end of life plastic management? And I, that's gonna be my only question because I know it's kind of a big far ranging question. So one of the things I, I recommended that we emphasize in terms of the R&D, in terms of the uh, investment there and the research, is that we um, have industry participate with the scientists, with government to look at you know, what kinds of policies can help uh, make innovations uh, you know, more uh, implementable or, or accelerate the implementation, and also even community partners. So we really need to look at co-creation of solutions. I think that will be really beneficial in, in terms of um, ensuring that, that uh, we're going to coordinate between product design and end of life. So we, we need to bring the OEMs that make automobiles in with with Mark's group and and also involve uh, you know those that are responsible for end of life recycling infrastructure, so I think that that interdisciplinary approach and co creation of solutions is important. And then the other is we really need to look at you know Europe really helped push uh, you know reducing the amount of waste in automobiles with their guidelines. Uh, um, one, uh, it was mentioned about Germany. Well, Europe, the Europe set guidelines on automobiles to reduce the amount of auto shredder residue, the amount of waste. Um, and those kinds of policies can also help um, accelerate, you know, solutions that are technological. And, and so I think that's important as well. Thank you. Um, I have to say, and I, this comes somewhat from, well, this I had a personal experience not too long ago where I was, um, on an island in the Caribbean, I know that right, play, play me a violin, right? That sounds so sad. But anyway, one of the things, and it was a very rustic island, and one of the things that really struck me, of course, those there are a lot of places in the world that just have a tremendous amount of trouble moving their trash, quite honestly, um, because of being um, ocean locked. And I understand those concerns. Um, as a result, I had saw little to no effort to recycle because they're they just had trouble getting plain old trash off the island, let alone dealing with plastics recycling. But it was it was tragic because here I was in a beautiful place with just an abundance of plastic waste all over the place. 
And so I think we're going to have to get to a point where the manufacturers are looking at how that end of life solution, that end of plastic life management, where you know there, there's some way other than just, especially because this is such a global problem. And if we don't look at global solutions, we're just never going to solve it. So um, thank you very much for your input. Thank you all. This has been um, really very helpful for the parts that I was able to participate in and listen to. I, I really enjoyed. Thank you. But Madam Chair, I yield back. Excellent. Well, congratulations to my colleague for her three hearings and managing to, to make it in for this one because your your voice and viewpoints are are very in, important to us. And um look, we we are gonna bring the the, the hearing to a to a close. Um we, we don't have any more questions. Um, I, I do want to thank our science committee staff on, on both sides of the aisle. I'm here in the committee room and it is absolutely set up expertly with great professionalism. Um, we were able to do this in a hybrid format as uh, we, uh, you know, start to kind of come back to the way things were. Uh, and that's never a light switch as we've been learning in this pandemic, but we were able to achieve the success uh, and, and goal of, of this hearing. And, and frankly, we're in, in a nice springboard, as I was saying, to, to what's next. And we're going to continue to leave the, the, the record open for, for two weeks for additional statements uh, from members or additional questions that, the, that, that members may have of the, the witnesses. I, I know we are going to continue to draw down on the expertise of um, the, this just great panel of witnesses. And so at this time, um, the witnesses are going to be virtually excused. They're going to be excused and the hearing is now adjourned.